She made me promise that if anything ever happened to her, I would take any information that I had to the police. Something did happen. She was murdered in front of her children. The investigation led back to her husband. I emphatically deny any involvement in my wife's murder. I knew Fred was lying. He lied constantly. I said, this is an execution. We've got to find out why. Sunday afternoon, November 29th, 1992. The end of a Thanksgiving weekend. 39-year-old Sarah Tokar has loaded up the car with her two boys, six-year-old Ricky and four-year-old Mike. She was making the nine-hour drive from her parents' house in Bradenton, Florida, back to her home just north of Atlanta. They were all singing. I'll be home for Christmas, and very, very happy about it. Uh, just about as they were driving out of the driveway, the phone rang, and I ran into the house and answered it, and it was Fred. Sarah's husband of seven years, Fred Tokars, wanted to know if Sarah was still at the house. Fred, a defense attorney, had left the family gathering one day earlier to meet a client in Montgomery, Alabama. John Ambrusco told his son-in-law that Sarah was just leaving. Just before 10 p.m., Sarah Tokars pulled into her garage in the suburban community of Marietta, Georgia. The street was quiet. Mike had fallen asleep in the back seat. As Sarah started unloading the car, she was startled by a male intruder. He's wearing a black watch cap, dressed in dark clothing. And uh, he forces uh, Sarah and Rick back out to the vehicle. The man was armed with a sawed-off shotgun. He ordered Sarah to start driving. Six-year-old Ricky would later tell police that the gunman demanded that his mother make a right turn. She protested that it was a dead-end street and pulled over. He tells Sarah, don't be f***ing with me. And Sarah says... I'm not with you. I can't turn here. And about that time, he shoots her in the back of the head. The gunman jumped out of the moving vehicle and ran off. The Toyota, with the boys still inside, coasted into an open field and rolled to a stop. Ricky reached across his mother's body to turn off the ignition. Sarah had always told him not to leave vehicles running. It wasn't safe. So he takes the keys from the truck, and they see some lights from a house. It was quite a walk for them, but they managed, and they went to this house and knocked on the door and said that his mother had been hurt very badly. The residents called police. Pat Banks was the first detective to approach the vehicle and see Mrs. Tokars slumped over in the front seat. One thing I always remember was she had long hair and the blood would just run down and just the droplets would drop off of there. Another officer directed Banks to an ambulance where the two young boys were being treated for shock. The children hadn't been physically hurt, but the first thing I noticed when the ambulance doors opened up was the smell of vomit. Michael's shirt was off and he had gotten sick. They both spattered with their mother's blood. Sarah Tokars was pronounced dead at the scene. Police alerted her husband, Fred, who was staying overnight in Alabama. He made arrangements for the two boys to stay with his brother. The police also contacted the rest of Sarah's family in Florida. The next day, Cobb County, Georgia investigators searched the Tokar's home. The house had been burglarized, but police quickly concluded that it was suspicious. My first impression was that the scene was staged to make it look like a burglary, and it was not a burglary. Nothing of value had been taken from the house. 
Detectives learned the home alarm had been deactivated. The killer entered through a sliding glass door with a broken lock. A few days later, Sarah's parents and sisters gathered at a hotel in Atlanta to commiserate and to discuss what they knew about the murder. Sarah's father, Dr. John Ambrusco, came to the same conclusion as the detectives. I said, this isn't a holdup. Nothing was stolen. I said, this is an execution. Somebody had that girl killed. And we got to find out who did that and why. He said, I'm an old man. I may not live to see this solved, so you girls have to make sure that this is what we're going to do as a family. One member of the family didn't seem as anxious to participate as the others. Sarah's husband, defense attorney Fred Tokars. We've been attempting to get Mr. Tokars to come in and, and talk to us. Uh, we're having a difficult time getting him to come in. So we explained to him that he should know better than anybody how important it is that, that we get something rolling right away before the trail got cold. On December 3rd, friends and family gathered for Sarah Tokar's funeral. Fred Tokar's, who still hadn't given a formal interview to police, walked with his mother. By this time, Sarah's family had serious doubts about his behavior. I'd never seen anybody act like him before. He was just more anxious than sad. He never talked about Sarah. He never said, oh my God, poor Sarah. Oh, what she went through, poor Rick and Mike. He was just all acting like, I'm scared. I gotta get out of Dodge, he kept saying. Gretchen Schaefer recalls that her brother-in-law took her aside and explained why he was avoiding the authorities. He said, Gretchen, I hope you understand. The reason I can't go to the police about anything is because I've taken a lot of money from some shady clients and not paid taxes on them. And I'm afraid if they look into my business dealings, they'll accuse me of tax evasion. Fred Tokars would soon face charges more serious than tax evasion. I thought he was that smart, smarter than cops. He was wrong. The murder of Sarah Tokars in November 1992 stunned the metro Atlanta area. The 39-year-old housewife had been abducted from her home, forced into her car, and shot in the head while her two sons watched. Her husband, Fred Tokars, was an up-and-coming attorney. The Atlanta news media latched onto the story, comparing it to a popular movie. One of the stories early on was that it was kind of a Cape Fear type of situation, that here's a lawyer who had a client that somehow had it out for him, and so uh, one of the lawyers was telling us that the, the, he knew of several lawyers buying guns. It was a theory authorities considered early on. We wanted to know about anyone that he might have been associated with who may have had some ill will toward him or his wife. The focus of our investigation originally was that maybe they were after him and not Mrs. Tokars. A week after the murder on December 6th, Tokars agreed to be questioned by police. Detective Ron Hutton conducted the interrogation. Tokars, do you have any idea who may have wanted to kill Sarah? Just can you imagine it? He was pretty nervous. He talked a lot, uh, but at the same time, he didn't give us a whole lot of information. He couldn't remember details. Tokars did reveal that he and his wife owned several life insurance policies. The policies would pay him $1.75 million upon her death. What kind of insurance policies did you have on Sarah then? Sarah and I have the same type of insurance policies. One of them is for um, $250,000. One of them is for a million. And I think that there's another one for, uh, for a half a million. Tokars maintained that he and Sarah had a good relationship. Every marriage has its ups and downs, but I, 
I would be shocked if I thought that she was considering a divorce right now from me. She sleep with you? Yeah. She have sex with you? Yeah. But police were already uncovering evidence to the contrary. We had spoken to Rick and Mike, Sarah's uh, small children, and they had told us that she did not sleep with Fred. The marriage between Fred and Sarah Tokars was not in good shape and hadn't been for quite some time. Sarah didn't like the sort of people he was dealing with, uh, the hours he was keeping. In fact, the more police learned about Fred Tokars, the more he was becoming their prime suspect. Fred Tokars and Sarah Ambrusco had married in 1985. They were both 32 years old. At the time, Sarah was a successful nightclub promoter. Fred would eventually start his own law practice. Within three years, they had two sons and moved to a house in Marietta, an affluent suburb of Atlanta. Sarah was no longer working outside the home. The thing that was the most important to her was to be a mom and to be a really good mom, and she succeeded 100% with that. On the surface, she and Fred appeared happy. But Sarah confided to her sisters that her marriage was failing. Her husband, she said, had a dark side. She'd call me up and say, Karen, I don't know what to do. He's just always yelling at me all the time and always mad. And she tried so hard in the beginning to try to make everything be even and at peace for the boys so that they didn't have to grow up in a house of all fighting and yelling and things like that. She told her sisters Fred was rarely home, kept her on a strict allowance, and spent very little time with the boys. She suspected he was having affairs. Sarah considered divorce, but fearing that she would lose custody of her sons, she dropped the idea. By the summer of 1992, she was again contemplating divorce. On the advice of her attorney, she hired a private detective to get proof that her husband was cheating. I was on a stakeout and did uncover him having an affair, uh, and we identified the party. Sarah confronted Fred with the information. He dismissed the affair as a meaningless dalliance. Sarah didn't buy it and stopped trusting her husband altogether. She told me that she was afraid of Fred, that he had threatened that if she got a divorce, that he had enough contacts that she would never take the children away. Sarah decided to get herself a bargaining chip against the threats. Without Fred's knowledge, she began copying financial documents from his safe in the basement. Sarah took the copies to her sister Chrissy's apartment. Some were bank records from accounts that Tokars had opened in the Bahamas. We sat on the floor and we looked at them, and they looked very suspicious to us. There were accounts with, it looked like hundreds of thousands of dollars in them, with what looked like phony names on the accounts. Sarah feared that some of her husband's clients who were drug dealers were getting him involved in money laundering. She gave the bank records to her sister for safekeeping. Then, just before Thanksgiving 1992, Sarah telephoned her sister Karen. She said she found a way to divorce her husband and get custody of the boys. She said, Karen, I've got all this new stuff on Fred. And she was relieved that this was finally her way out. And I said, what, Sarah, what? Tell me what it was. And she said, no, I can't. I'll tell you when I see you. Two and a half weeks later, Sarah Tokars was murdered. Did she know too much? Sarah's last statement to her private detective indicated she might have had a hunch about her fate. She made me promise that if anything ever happened to her, I would take any information that I had to the police. The private eye did go to the police. Authorities now had two reasons to consider Fred Tokars the lead suspect in his wife's murder. Number one, Sarah posed a real danger to him of exposing 
his criminal activity. And secondly, there was the motivation of insurance policies. But investigators also knew he hadn't pulled the trigger. If he was responsible, he had found someone else to do it for him. The Ambrusco family agreed to speak with reporters to ask for help from the public. This is something for us to do to try to help and make sure that someone else's sister or loved one can't get hurt like this. And that's what we're going to do. We'll just won't rest until we can get some justice. Within a month of the murder, based on tips from the public, police had solved one part of the mystery, the identity of the gunman. There was an anonymous telephone call followed up by other telephone calls from related people in the Atlanta area who told us that we ought to be looking at a person by the name of Curtis Rower. 22-year-old Curtis Rower was a drug addict and small-time dealer. He had bragged about the murder to some friends who called police. When he was picked up, Rower confessed immediately. He said he'd been hired to kill Sarah Tokars for $5,000 by a 28-year-old businessman with a criminal record named Eddie Lawrence. Lawrence would be the link that led back to Fred Tokars. Eddie Lawrence is nothing more than a street mutt in a suit. That's all he is. Um, con man. Um, he's just a low-life mutt. It turned out the small-time hood had a history with Fred Tokars. Back in January 1992, 10 months before the murder, Eddie Lawrence had hired Tokars to be his attorney on a counterfeiting charge. Soon after, Tokars began investing in Eddie Lawrence Industries, which included a construction company. Police found it curious that in his first two interviews, Tokars failed to bring up Eddie Lawrence when they questioned him about his business associates. He told us a lot. Two, over two hours probably we talked to him, he told us a lot, but he never once mentioned Eddie Lawrence. When Tokars returned for a third interview, police confronted him about his business partner. I throw a picture down, a bookend photo of Lawrence down on the table in front of Tokars. You know that man? It's Eddie Lawrence. This man was never mentioned. Well, I'm not sure if I understand what you're talking about. You never told me anything about Eddie Lawrence. Well, you never asked me anything about it. So, obviously, by this time, we're really looking at Fred hard. And uh, it's starting to add up on him. It really is. And we're really on to him then. On December 23, 1992, Cobb County prosecutors named Fred Tokars as a suspect in his wife's murder. That same day, the district attorney charged his alleged accomplices, Curtis Rower and Eddie Lawrence, with the murder of Sarah Tokars. And there was more. Federal prosecutors announced that Fred Tokars was under investigation for drug trafficking and money laundering. The overwhelming publicity was so heavy against him. I've been a criminal defense lawyer for over 20 years. And I have covered everything in this, in this state. I have never seen anything like the publicity in this. On the day of the announcements, Tokars and his two sons were in Florida, preparing to spend Christmas with the family of his murdered wife. Fred insisted on coming with us, unfortunately. And Fred kept telling us, quit talking to the press, quit talking to the police, just let this all die down. And I kept saying, Fred, why? And he said, well, the police are just stupid. The next day, Christmas Eve, Fred Tokars checked into a hotel in Florida and took an overdose of sleeping pills. He wrote a suicide note in which he proclaimed his innocence. I loved Sarah, he wrote. Never hurt her, and I have now died for her. A family member grew worried when Fred didn't answer the phone and alerted hotel security. Tokars was rushed to the hospital. Fred's suicide attempt showed two things. One, that he was involved and that he was guilty and he knew that they were closing in on him. And two, that 
we had to just be so careful with the boys because we felt that he, the boys were not safe with Fred. On December 31st, 1992, Tokars called a news conference to defend himself. Rick and Mike, I emphatically deny any involvement in my wife's murder and any suggestion that I might have been involved in any way deeply hurts me. Unfortunately, after drinking too much and after taking some back pain medication, I became very depressed and started to think of the lifestyle that I was losing, not only my wife, but my, my whole lifestyle. When Fred said his lifestyle, it was just another one of those things that we all just thought was just so strange and it seemed so selfish that how could he be thinking about his lifestyle when his wife was brutally murdered in front of his two little boys. Police were now convinced Tokars had played a role in his wife's murder, but they didn't arrest him just yet. They needed more evidence about the murder for hire scheme. We had to tie in Eddie Lawrence with Tokars and only until finally Eddie Lawrence turned state's evidence and at that point in time we had the smoking gun. It took eight months but in August 1993 Eddie Lawrence appeared in court to enter his plea on the murder of Sarah Tokars. How do you plead to the charge in count one? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Are you in fact guilty of that? In exchange for his guilty plea Lawrence was spared the death penalty and sentenced instead to life in prison. He agreed to testify against Fred Tokars twice at a federal trial, charging that Tokars laundered money for a cocaine smuggling ring, and at a state murder trial. On August 25, 1993, nine months after the murder, Fred Tokars was arrested. His federal trial came first. After weeks of grueling testimony over whether the attorney had gotten too close to his drug-dealing clients, the jury reached a verdict in April 1994. Guilty on all counts, including an added charge of using interstate phone lines to plan his wife's execution. I think that the evidence withstood the intense scrutiny by the jury, which it did. Tokar's mother, Norma, was visibly shaken. But this was only the beginning. She still had to watch her son face a murder charge in a Georgia courtroom. Mrs. Tokars, <laughs> is your son guilty of murder? No, no, no! Sarah's family also spoke to the media. I can't look at Fred. All I thought to myself the whole time they were reading guilty, guilty, guilty was after Sarah was murdered, we all, we all felt so bad that we weren't there to help her or protect her. On the federal charges, Fred Tokars was sentenced to four life terms without the possibility of parole. In April 1994, Atlanta defense attorney Fred Tokars was convicted of drug trafficking and money laundering. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Tokar still faced the death penalty on charges that he had arranged the murder of his wife, Sarah. I just honestly felt, as I think most of, uh, most of the community, uh, that this was a case in which the death penalty, if there ever should be a death penalty, uh, should be sought. By this time, the story had caught the attention of Hollywood producers. In fact, it emerged that the two lead detectives, Ron Hunton and Pat Banks of Cobb County, had signed away the rights to their story during the murder investigation. I never, never in my life have seen the two primary investigators on a murder case signing a movie deal and getting money, uh, you know, in the midst of the investigation. It's insanity. The two detectives admitted they had sold their stories to a Hollywood producer. They now say they made a mistake, but insist that it did not affect their investigation. Whatever they tried to say about us, about our credibility or lack thereof, they could not destroy that case. The case was put together on fact and good investigative police work. 
if you can't attack the evidence, attack the officer. If everything's sewn up in a neat bag, try to discredit the people who are presenting it. In 1994, the Cobb County Police Department fired both detectives. Finally, in January 1997, four years after his wife's murder, the trial of attorney Fred Tokar is convened in northern Georgia. The judge ordered a change of venue because of the intense media coverage in Atlanta. Prosecutors argued that Fred Tokars had become enthralled with the easy money of his client's criminal world and did not want to lose it. He had the perfect life that most people would think, a beautiful wife and two lovely children and a successful career. And he threw it all away because he was greedy. Prosecutors argued that Tokars wanted his wife killed for two simple reasons. To protect his criminal drug enterprises, and to collect $1.75 million in life insurance. Once again, the star witness was Tokar's former business partner, Eddie Lawrence. Prosecutors asserted that Tokar's had cultivated a friendship with Lawrence for a purpose. Fred associated with him after hours, went to bars with him, ate with him, um, visited with him. They got to be close and this was a planned, programmed attempt to get Eddie Lawrence beholden to tow cars so that Fred, at the right time, could implore Lawrence to find him a hitman. Eddie Lawrence testified that when the right time came, tow cars offered him $25,000 to plan the murder. Lawrence, in turn, hired Curtis Rower as the hitman. Lawrence told the jury that he already owed Tokar's money in connection with a construction company and other businesses they owned together. He said that Tokar's had threatened to shut them all down and ruin him if he didn't cooperate. Lawrence testified that on the day of the hit, he met Tokar's at his law office to go over plans. He said that when he arrived at the office building, he signed in under an assumed name and took the elevator. That night, he drove to Tokar's house in Marietta, Georgia, with hitman Curtis Rower. Rower waited for Sarah Tokar's to arrive home from her Florida vacation with her two sons, and then killed her. Eddie was a very articulate witness. He had good memory of uh, dates and places and times and events that went back years. Predictably, the defense had another opinion about the state's star witness. If he was Pinocchio, they'd have to, to drive a logging truck in here with his nose on it. And he's a liar, and he's a cheat, and he's a scoundrel. Defense attorney Jerry Froelich said that Lawrence's plea bargain gave him every reason to lie about his client, Fred Tokars. Lawrence was a black man in the most conservative county in this state and was facing the murder of a, of a white woman. You know, he was going to the chair. So he had to come up with a story. One of the primary things that I was concerned about was the meeting between Fred Tokars and Eddie Lawrence on the Sunday before her death. I think we proved that that meeting never took place. You could not press a button on a Sunday and go to someone's office. That, in fact, you needed a key because it is a secured elevator on Sunday. Defense attorney Froelich showed the court that the name on the sign-in sheet, which Lawrence claimed was his, really belonged to someone else in the office building that day. The defense team argued that the person responsible for the murder was not Fred Tokars, but Eddie Lawrence alone. Lawrence, they said, had an obvious motive. He owed the defendant money and was trying to send him a message. Lawrence knew that Fred was going to cut him off from funds. And Lawrence may have been just trying to, to retaliate against Fred and put Fred's life in such a chaos that he wouldn't cut off Lawrence. Prosecutors countered that Eddie Lawrence knew far too many details about Sarah Tokar's Florida trip. When she would arrive home and how to get into the house, 
Details he could only have learned from Fred Tokars. The state put on other witnesses to confirm that Tokars had indeed gone looking for someone to kill his wife. He came into contact with a number of prostitutes, dancers, that were very colorful in and of themselves and had some very good evidence to give against Fred Tokars. One woman, an exotic dancer named Dion Ferrin, said she was Fred Tokar's mistress. She testified that Fred talked openly about getting Lawrence to kill his wife, Sarah. When Fred talked about taking care of Sarah, did Fred say anything about who might do it? Hey, Lawrence. And did Fred say anything about why he was choosing Eddie Lawrence? Because he owed him money. A prostitute also testified that Tokars paid her $100 for sex in a limousine and wanted to know if she knew a drug pusher who could kill his wife. She said that at first she thought Tokars was joking. Why is it because your wife's not satisfying you in bed or something? And he said no, it was because she was divorcing him and she knew too much and he had too much to lose. Juror Mary Del Morris found this story hard to believe. She had oral sex, and Fred asked her if she knew of someone that would get rid of someone for him. All in 20 minutes. Kind of unbelievable. But the defense was unable to challenge the credibility of the murder victim's family. They testified about Fred Tokar's strange behavior, both before and after the murder. Sarah's cousin, Mary Taylor, told the jury about a telephone conversation she had with Sarah several days before the murder happened. Taylor said she had worried that Sarah's life was in jeopardy because her cousin knew too much about her husband's shady business activities. To ask Sarah, are you safe? Yes. And what was her reply? She said, oh, Mayor, you worry too much. Next time you heard about Sarah Tokars, was she dead? She was dead. During the trial, the Ambrusco family was hammered, if I can use that term, pretty harshly on cross-examination by the defense team. Defense attorneys suggested that Sarah's family was painting Fred Tokars in the worst possible light. They said that he was stingy, that he was cheap. Yet, if you ever went to the house, um, the house was loaded with toys for the children. The children went to private schools. The wife had a, uh, a new Jeep with a television in it. They believed that Fred did it, and so they were going to slant and say things. The defense had won the argument to keep 10-year-old Ricky Tokars from testifying against his father about the night of the murder. Two years earlier, Ricky had taken the stand in the trial of gunman Curtis Rower. At the time, the eight-year-old recalled what he told his brother after his mother was shot. Yeah, I, uh, I told him we had to go get help. For his father's murder trial, prosecutors were allowed to tell Ricky's story another way. They read his previous testimony into the record. And the man goes, turn here. And my mom goes, is it okay if I just drop you off here because I'm in shock. I'm so scared. What did the man say? Don't try to f with me. And what did your mom say? I'm not trying to f with you. Ricky Tokars testified that he then saw the gunman shoot his mother in the head. In closing arguments, the defense claimed that the state's case was circumstantial. The only person who had linked Tokars to the crime was the least trustworthy and had the biggest reason to lie. Eddie Lawrence, who had testified as part of a plea bargain to avoid the death penalty. Most of the people that Eddie was involved with, he had flim flammed, taken them from, for money. If you don't believe Eddie Lawrence, then you can't convict Fred. Prosecutors countered that the evidence against Tokars was overwhelming. They repeated an argument that Sarah's father, Dr. John Ambrusco, had made during the murder investigation. 
Ambrusco had come up with four questions that should identify the killer. Number one was, who knew that Fred was going to be out of town? Number two was, who knew when Sarah would get home? Number three, who knew that the burglar alarm was disconnected? And number four, who knew that the lock on that door going into the house had broken? The prosecution argued that there was only one person who knew the answers to all four questions, Fred Tokars. The district attorney urged the jury to remember the victim and punish the man responsible. What about Sarah? And all she cares about is the protection of her children. Only to have her brains blown out over those two little boys. Because of the mastermind over here. Because of the greed, the unparalleled ambition, and because she just simply was in the way. The fate of Fred Tokars now rested with the jury. In March 1997, the murder trial of Atlanta defense attorney Fred Tokars went to the jury. They were deciding whether he had set up the murder of his wife, Sarah. Tokars faced the death penalty. After deliberating for 12 and a half hours, the jury announced it had reached a decision. Judge James Bodiford prepared the courtroom with a warning. We're not going to have any outburst what whatsoever in the courtroom. It's just not proper. Bring in the jury, please. <coughs> Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict in all the issues that were presented to you? Yes, Your Honor, we have. We, the jury, find beyond a reasonable doubt that the offender caused or directed another to commit murder. The jury then read the sentence of Fred Tokars. We, the jury, have found beyond a reasonable doubt that one or more of the alleged statutory aggravating circumstances do exist, and we recommend a life sentence to be imposed. It was a stunning ruling. The jury found enough aggravating factors to recommend the death penalty, but decided to impose a life sentence instead. Tokars cried with relief. He looked for his mother seated behind him in the courtroom. And he turned around and whispered, I'm okay, I love you, uh, to his mom before being escorted out. I'm so happy and so thankful, I'm so glad. Life is sweet. But for the family of Sarah Tokars, it was a bitter ending. They thought Tokars deserved death. Fred knew that Sarah and Rick and Mike were gonna walk into that house that night. He knew that Rick and Mike were gonna be there. And we can't understand how anyone can plan the murder of a young mother like that and be spared. Who was there to spare Sarah? No one was there to show Sarah any mercy. Jurors later revealed that there were two holdouts against the death penalty who managed to convince the 10 others. Both were retired women who had worked in medicine. Well, after 30-something years in the medical field trying to save life and preserve it, it would be hard for me to say, okay, let's get rid of him. I don't think Fred Tokars deserved the death penalty because he didn't pull the trigger. Mary Del Morris now says that the jurors also considered what kind of impact the sentence would have on Tokar's sons, Ricky and Mike? I was thinking that the boys had lost their mother, and if they lost their father too, it would um, be more devastating than ever. She thought that if he was a father, he's an animal. Anyone who could plan a murder and kill the mother in front of the two little boys is not a father. One juror, who originally voted for death, later said he regretted his change of heart and felt badly for Sarah's family. I wanted to apologize to them. I wanted to tell them that I was sorry. Um, Karen Wilcox looked, right, looked, looked me right in the face and, and, and asked me, you know, I, she was mouthing and she said, how could you do this? To me, that was completely an injustice, an injustice done to Sarah. And that the rest of those jurors went along with that. They let her down. They let us down. 
Following the murder trial, Fred Tokars was incarcerated at a federal prison in Atlanta. He lost contact with his two sons. The $1.75 million in life insurance money, originally intended to go to Fred Tokars, is now in a trust for the two boys. Ricky and Mike Tokars were sent to live in Florida with their grandfather, Dr. John Ambrusco. I thought if I could just live a few more years to give them a safe, secure area where they could grow up, and then Joni and Chrissy came to help us, and they worked like dogs trying to work with the boys. When their grandparents passed away, the boys' aunt Joni became their guardian. All have tried to give them some semblance of a normal childhood. The two brothers, shown here with their little league team, have undergone extensive counseling. They still struggle with the awful memory of their mother's execution. What every child fears is the boogeyman, and that became reality to them. And for their whole life, they will have to live with that terror. Psychologists always talk about closure, but for our family, there is no closure. Because we have the life sentence now of living with this horrific grief. Fred Tokars was a very bright person. It was a tremendous waste of a very talented person who could have been very successful, even beyond what success he, he already enjoyed. And he threw it all away, and he destroyed all the lives around him. If I ever had the chance, I'd kill him myself because of what he did. I hope he burns in hell. And whatever his life is like now, it's too good. It's too good for him.